But Michael, welcome to our COT conference and over uh, to thanks you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thank you for uh, that introduction. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm going to be talking about generative AI in professional education and research. My background is in physiotherapy. Um, I might use some examples, but in general, I'm going to try and present this at quite a high, uh, high level. It's not going to be very technical, but I am going to go through the, uh, the slides quite quickly, just in the interest of time, because there's quite a lot to get through. So I'm sure that everyone has a basic idea of what we mean when we talk about generative AI. In general, I'm talking about things like ChatGPT, Claude, and Gemini. Those are the main frontier models that we're seeing. Uh, generative AI is a next word predictor. That's all that it does. Uh, it takes your prompt as an input, and it says, based on this prompt, what is the probability of the next word in the sentence being X? It weighs those probabilities against all other possible words, and then it chooses one that is the most likely word to put into the sentence. And this is why generative AI actually struggles with counting because the only thing that it is doing is predicting the next word in the sentence. And so if you ask it for a 50 word sentence and it's at word number 40, it doesn't know what the next words in the sentence can be because it can only ever see one word ahead. So this is one of the challenges that we have with uh, generative AI um, because it, it is very limited. It's actually very limited in, in what its uh, capabilities are. Generative AI is multimodal. Um, so in addition to text, we're seeing frontier models that can now manipulate and manage and understand. I'll use that word um, very carefully. Um, it can understand audio, image, and video. It's increasing in competence through a range of different technologies. And the only one I'm really going to mention quickly is RAG. RAG is Retrieval Augmented Generation. And what that does is that instead of the generative AI um, creating its response one word at a time based on your prompt, what it first does is it takes your prompt, creates a series of keywords, um, and then goes to the internet and searches, um, well, goes to the internet, or it could query a, a local database of documentation that you've already provided. So it takes your prompt, does a keyword search, retrieves some documents, and then bases its generated responses on the documents that it's just retrieved. And this really helps a lot with increasing accuracy and reducing hallucination in the language model responses. Generative AI is everywhere. It's already built into the next version of Microsoft Windows. It's built into software. Every day we're seeing hundreds of applications being released that um, are built on a core of generative AI. We're seeing it in cars and phones. And what this really means is that we now have intelligence on demand for everyone essentially for free. And again, I'll caveat that by saying that I know it's not really for everyone and it's not really for free. Um, but essentially, uh, most people in the world with an internet connection now have access to some level of generative AI that can be quite useful for their needs. Uh, the newer uh, versions of these um, frontier models have bigger context windows. The context window is the input that you give it, the prompt, plus any documentation that you provided for the model to query. And this allows it to have much more accurate responses to increasingly complex prompts. And just as an example, uh, some of the uh, bigger models can now take up to a million tokens, um, sometimes two million, depending on uh, which model we're looking at. And these are not really available for the consumer. So our version of ChatGPT that we have access to doesn't have this kind of um, context window, but you could essentially take, uh, for the research versions of these models, you could take the en entire corpus of Harry Potter novels, that's about a million tokens, and give it to the language model and then start having a conversation about the world that it creates uh, using that documentation. There's a lot of confusion around what generative AI actually is. Um, for, uh, for the responses that we get from language models, they're not being retrieved from a database. They really are being generated one word at a time using the prompt as a starting point. And what this means is that there's a very little ability for a vanilla frontier model, so one that doesn't retrieve information or that doesn't have documentation that it can um, compare its response to. For those language models, there is no ground truth. There is no way for them to determine the kind of objective reality of the response that they're giving you. So they don't know when they're making things up. And even if you tell it that it's making things up, it's got nothing to check against to see whether or not, um, or to see how different its response is to reality. So they have no model of the world that they are referring to. This is why data provenance is a, um, is a problem for language models. So data provenance is just the idea that based on a, an outcome, we can track back through the data to determine the source of the outcome that we got. 
So we have a good sense of all the data points that make up the response that we're getting. And with uh, generative AI, that data provenance is, is really challenging. Um, but progress is being made and we're starting to see little glimpses of what it might look like when we can really have a good understanding of how generative AI is thinking. And again, I'm, I'm using that word thinking very carefully. I know that they don't think like human beings think, but just for want of a better word, um, the, the process that they use to take your prompt and generate a response, if we call that thinking, we're starting to see a little bit of insight into what that might look like. So why is this technology different? We're seeing new technologies all the time and none of them have really made a massive impact on our lives. Maybe the internet was the last one that really made a, a big difference. Um, so this is different, I think, for a few reasons. The scale and pace of change is happening faster than we can regulate. So it took six to 12 months for universities to even start thinking about developing policy and documentation around the response to generative AI, even though we knew from day one that this was going to have a massive impact on things like assessment. Um, AI gives everyone access to deep expertise across a wide range of knowledge domains. And this might be a little bit controversial, uh, I don't think it is, but if you start um, querying language models with relatively sophisticated prompts and a documentation database, they can give you incredibly deep insight into uh, very specific knowledge domains. And if everyone has access to that, we, we start to see a society needing to respond in a very different way to the way that we've responded to other technologies. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about the next point, but language models can be used to generate code and that code can be used to build new kinds of software tools. And so what kinds of creative applications are we going to see emerging when anyone in the world through natural language has the ability to build their own unique, bespoke, customized software applications? What are the kinds of tools that you might build with natural language if you could just tell your, your computer what it is that you need to do? Another interesting difference is that language models don't have instruction manuals. All that you get when you go to these chatbots is a text entry field. And what they've started doing is giving you examples of prompts. So all of them now have a little bit of text um, that give you an example of the kinds of things you might want to give the language models. Now, if your prompt looks like that, you're not going to get a very good response. Um, and this leads me on to the next point that I want to make is that um, unlike other pieces of technology, you and the language model are jointly responsible for the quality of the outputs that you get. So that contextual um, information that you provide the language model with is really important. If you ask a very simple question, you're going to get a very simple answer. And what this uh, leads to is a lot of people experimenting a little bit with language models asking quite simplistic questions, and then getting a response where they look at that and say, well, that's not uh, actually that interesting. It's not that impressive. Nothing to see here. Uh, let's move on. And I think once you start experimenting with language models and you start spending real time with them and you realize what they're capable of, then I think your, your opinion might change. So this idea of writing prompts, um, I think a lot of people think of it in the same way as keyword search. But the prompt that you write is actually creating the boundaries of the world that the model uses to think with. So when you give it a prompt, you're actually um, constraining the model to respond uh, within the boundaries of what it is that you're including in the prompt. And so the contextual richness of that prompt is a really important indicator of the quality of the generated response. More context means a higher quality output. Some of the prompts that I give language models when I use them will run on to thousands of words. Um, and so the more sophisticated that prompt is, the more contextual awareness you give the language model, the better the output that you're going to get. You'll find lots and lots of uh, prompting frameworks, um, you know, more than 20, 30 at the last time I looked. They all tend to say the same thing and they all revolve around this idea of context contextual richness. The simplest heuristic that I found is role, goal, instruct. Um, essentially, you wanna say to the language model, you are, you give it a role. You give yourself uh, a role, you give it a goal. I want, uh, through this interaction, I want to get this, this is the outcome, and then an instruction. And the instruction can be quite explicit. You can say, in step one, I want you to do this. In step two, I want you to do this. In step three, I want you to refer back to step one. So you can be quite sophisticated in the kinds of instructions that you can give language models. 
I'm going to move on now, uh, now that we've done an overview of generative AI in more general terms, what might it mean for assessment design? And I've seen a lot of people talking about um, AI resilient assessment tasks. I don't think that's the right way to, to go, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail um, uh, next. <laughs> I think that AI detection is a lost cause. Um, there are uh, AI detection tools that are built into platforms like Turnitin. Um, they're not very good and they're very easy to defeat. So if a student wants to use AI to generate uh, responses to your assessment task, they are going to be able to do it. Less sophisticated users will get caught, um, but students who really want to cheat can, um, with very few tweaks, um, they can uh, get around the AI detection tools that already exist. And just to give you a sense of how much of a lost cause this is, uh, OpenAI, which is the company that built ChatGPT, they uh, removed their um, AI detection tool uh, because they uh, said that it was inaccurate and unable to, with any reliability, determine whether or not text had been created by ChatGPT. Now, if the company that builds ChatGPT is not able to determine when its own tool is being used to generate content, I'm not sure uh, how confident I would be in other companies that say that they can do that. I think that we should be looking at AI as a response to the standard assessment paradigm. So the standard assessment paradigm is where we use a predefined set of items to infer claims about students' proficiency. The data used for these are sparse. We don't have much of that data, and student learning isn't the focus of the assessment. I think we can use AI to support student learning in ways that we've never really been able to do before. And if AI gives students superhuman abilities, I think that our assessments should change to evaluate superhuman outcomes. I don't think we should use assessment design to solve the AI problem. I think we should use AI to solve the assessment design problem. There are some challenges using AI in learning, teaching, and assessment. The capabilities that are enabled by generative AI are mostly latent. So students and staff are really unable to take real advantage of the capabilities of language models. And there's three main reasons for this. We have a very kind of low digital and AI literacy skills in health professions, education, and in clinical practice. There is a lack of institutional support for all stakeholders. So we see universities very reluctantly moving forward. Um, and even when they are moving forward and trying to support people, it's within a very narrowly constrained version of everything that might be possible. And that kind of leads me on to that last point, which is a very limited understanding of what is actually possible with the cutting edge uh, capabilities of frontier language models. I think assessment is uh, also something that takes place in an assessment, which is largely unchanged by generative AI. So we still see learning, teaching, and research happening in very traditional ways. And if we were going to start uh, integrating AI into our assessment tasks, we would necessarily have to see changes in uh, other areas of the higher education ecosystem. I'm going to very quickly go through some use cases for generative AI in the context of education and research. Um, I think the main heuristic that I would like to encourage is not to think of uh, generative AI as some kind of an oracle that has the answers to all of our questions. I think we should ask it for ideas rather than answers. And then this whole problem of hallucination just kind of evaporates, it goes away, because when we want ideas, we actually want creative responses. And so in that context, hallucination is a feature, not a bug. It's only when you ask it for accurate answers to questions that uh, it might be problematic. However, because of technologies like uh, retrieval augmented generation, that's seeing a massive increase in the accuracy of responses, I don't think that uh, this heuristic is going to hold true for very long. I think very soon we're actually going to be able to ask it for, uh, for the correct answers to questions that we care about. All right, so um, I think as a literature reviewer, um, I don't think that we are going to be doing literature reviews for that much longer. Um, I think we're already seeing massive advances in the ability of generative AI to do literature reviews. This is a task that I needed to complete uh, a couple of weeks ago. I needed to prepare a CPD activity for a group of clinicians in a, a local trust. I went to Google Scholar, downloaded five articles that just had key features and developing clinical reasoning as keywords. I just took the five with the highest citation counts. I gave it to Claude, which is uh, one of the kind of preferred language models that I use. I uploaded those five articles. I said, give me a summary. Tell me why the approach has merit, why it might be useful for me. Give me five, five key takeaways. 
and give me a set of principles for incorporating this concept into assessment tasks for the CPD activity. And the response was fantastic. Um, I could basically take the language model response and word for word, just copy it into my planning document for the CPD activity. Now, I was very confident in the response that it gave me because I know something about the key features approach in developing clinical reasoning. If you're going to be doing this for an area where you have uh, kind of a more of a novice uh, interest or you have less understanding, then you might want to spend more time just checking the accuracy of its response. Um, I said that idea generation is something that this is really good at. Uh, just here's an example of something that I uh, uh, just gave in preparation for this lecture. Um, I'm interested in the topic of generative AI in occupational therapy. I'd like to do a PhD. Do you have any suggestions for research questions I could explore? Now, if the language model is connected to the internet, like the more recent version of ChatGPT, Google's Gemini is also connected to the internet, you could ask it a much more sophisticated prompt where you could say, go to Google Scholar, do a keyword search on these, have a look at the abstracts, and tell me where are the areas where I should focus my attention in um, uh, for this topic. There are um, uh, uh, specific uh, software platforms that you can use to do a similar kind of uh, question. You can experiment with tools like ResearchRabbit and Elicit. Um, those are companies that are building literature review into the, uh, their products. Um, and so those are things that you could try out that would really give you a much better response than just the basic language models. Um, it's really effective as a writer. I know there's a lot of concern around people using it for writing. This is an example that I suggest uh, where it might be really good. Um, I was writing a book chapter. I had three documents. Two of those documents were slightly different versions of the book chapter. And a third document was all the notes that I'd collected over about six months, um, many thousands of words. And I needed to harmonize all three documents into one. And so I could go to Claude, I gave it three files, and I said, I want you to take all of the information in these files, and I want you to merge it into a single document. I said I wanted uh, you to take the role of an academic writer, but avoid stuffy, jargon-filled writing. And so it was able to take all of those documents and merge them into a single file that I could then use as the baseline for the chapter that I eventually submitted. Data an analysis. Um, I think we are very quickly going to get to the end of human beings doing any kind of qualitative data analysis. We've already outsourced all of our quantitative data analysis to tools like SPSS. Atlas TI and Invivo are already building language models into the next version of their uh, software. And I don't think it's going to be all that long before we upload transcripts and the language model will just do all of the data analysis for us. Um, having said that, we're not there yet. I would say at this point, I would use a language model to kind of double check your data analysis if you are doing qualitative data analysis. This was an example of a transcript that I took from my PhD that was anonymized. I uploaded it to a language model and I just said, do a them thematic analysis. The responses th that I've given here are a very brief summary. Um, I actually asked it to pull out relevant quotes from the transcript to support each theme and to give an explanation of what the theme was, and then to give me relationships between themes, and it did a fantastic job. It's very good at summarizing documentation, so I use it every day, um, summarize this article, summarize this report. I often will say, explain this article to me. Um, it's very good at using metaphor, so you might say, explain this article to me uh, using the metaphor of Formula One racing, photography, it doesn't matter. Um, anything that you give it, it will be able to give you a response. Um, I use it for summarizing meeting transcripts where uh, I don't attend a meeting. Now, I do this in Copilot, which is a kind of more private version of ChatGPT. It uses the same backend, but we have an institutional license, which means that the transcripts and the interactions never leave the university servers. They stay um, on, on our campus. And so we can uh, use Copilot to have kind of more sensitive interactions with language models where we don't want the documentation to be sent to the company. Uh, the last one is personas. Uh, language models can very realistic portray patients for OT education scenarios. Um, one of the examples that we give our students is we say, you are a, so we tell the language model, you are a specific type of patient. We can give it very structured prompts. Uh, so we can say you're a stroke survivor, you've lost your husband, you live alone, your kids are far away, blah, blah, blah. And we can take this prompt, 
and every student in the class can upload the same prompt to the language model, and every student ends up having a different conversation with the language model. We can take those um, transcripts of those conversations, and we can start doing very detailed analysis to look at the development of communication skills, empathy, and critical thinking um, of the students as part of those interactions with language model personas. So wrapping up, just looking forward on the horizon, generative AI enables customizable, contextually rich personas that are high level experts in a wide range of disciplines that we interact with through natural language. Now, if you pass that, pass that sentence, you'll see that there's quite a lot going on there, but I think very soon, this is the way that we will start thinking about language models. We're seeing open source models that are increasing in complexity and scale. Um, most of them now exceed GPT 3.5 level capabilities which means that they are very sophisticated, they're available for free, and a lot of them can run on small devices like laptops. This is gonna see an expo explosion of creativity and diversity, um, and it will avoid lock-in to some of the bigger um, uh, companies like OpenAI and Google. I mentioned before that I think this gives everyone access to expertise on demand. What is society going to look like when everyone has access to an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a doctor, a lawyer? I think very soon we're going to start seeing language models that language models that are agents acting on our intentions, uh, where we are essentially project managers that manage high-level objectives, and the agents then go off and recruit fine-tuned models that will achieve subcomponents of the projects that we're working on. Um, I suggest to everyone that they um, use AI to help you do better work rather than to ask it to do your work. Um, it's a slightly more nuanced framing of the way that we might use these language models. Um, but I think it changes the position and the agency. So in summary, generative AI systems are next word predictors that can generate multimodal content. They're rapidly improving in competence. They provide abundant expertise, creative ideation through natural language conversations, although biases and limitations do exist. There's a wide range of use cases across all aspects of research and professional learning. There are ethical implications around authorship, originality, and transparency. Um, and evaluating outputs remains critically important. And I caveat that by saying for now, because I'm not convinced that that's going to be uh, all that important moving forward. I suspect we're very soon at a point where we will trust these systems in the same way that we've come to trust things like Google Maps. And that is it. I apologize that I went through everything so quickly. I just felt like I needed to, uh, we needed to cover a lot. Thank you so much, Michael. Wow, <laughs> my head is just exploding. Um, I love it that you're really challenging us to think differently um, around how we approach the use of AI and you know that it can give us, as you said, superhuman abilities. Um, and it does make me wonder what research and education is going to look like in five years time, 10 years time, you know, what kind of roles and jobs, you know, we will, we will be um, doing uh, uh, using AI. Um, it, it's absolutely fascinating. There are so many questions coming through. Um, I'm just going to pick two, which I think are maybe indicative of the kinds of questions that, that, that are coming through. Um, so I'm going to pick one from um, Claire. So Claire has, has asked a question around how do we challenge academic writing that is submitted as learner's work, but has clearly been generated by an AI tool? Um, this is a complicated <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we already have rules um, and policies around academic dishonesty and, uh, you know, students cheating. So I would say that if a student is using a language model to write, um, to, to basically complete the assignment and they submit the assignment um, under their own name, then we already have rules and policies that will guide us in how we should respond to that. So I don't think that that's an AI problem. We've always had students who cheat. We've always had students who use essay models. We have policies to address that. This is not a problem for AI. Um, what I would suggest is that we encourage students to use AI, but we encourage them to use it in a way that supports their learning. So how can we use AI to challenge ourselves? Um, so the example that I gave uh, earlier was that we use it to expect, uh, we raise the bar for our expectations of what students submit. So uh, I don't think that essays are actually a good indicator of uh, any, any evidence of learning, to be honest. Um, in practice, very few people write essays. Um, so I'm not sure what essays are preparing students for in the real world. 
We can talk about how they help develop argument and the ability to um, kind of base our claims about the world on evidence. But there are other ways that we can do that that are more effective than essays. So I would rather we look at uh, moving away from essays as an assessment uh, paradigm and look towards using something like AI to do something a lot more effective. So don't write a campaign about health promotion. Use AI to build a health promotion activity where you look at, for example, reducing obesity in your community. Use AI to build a website, to build an app, to recruit people, to write your marketing content, to develop the surveys that we use to determine whether or not your um, promotion uh, campaign was effective. Uh, maybe actually do the research, publish a paper. Um, I think if we look at AI as something that supercharges everyone's capabilities, then let's raise the baseline expectation for what assessment should actually do, uh, rather than look at ways to uh, kind of demonize AI uh, that's used to cheat. Sorry, that's a very long rambling No, it, it, it's great. It's, it's really what you were saying about the, the prompting that we give it as well and the sophistication of the questions and the tasks that we employ it to do and how we harness it rather than it harness yeah. us. Perhaps, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll maybe just a very brief example. I use AI all the time where I upload a piece of my own work and I tell the AI to tell me why I'm wrong. Um, so why is my argument bad? Why is it weak? Uh, what have I left out? What are my assumptions? Uh, how can I make this better? So I, I treat it as a collaborator, as a critical friend. Um, and I would love to see, see students using it for that. Upload a version of your own writing and ask the AI to give you feedback. Perfect. I'm going to go at time for one more quick question. Um, again, lots of questions coming through, but um, this one is kind of indicative around um, practitioners using it. Um, a question from Inthuya. Um, are there any current guidelines around using AI for professionals within healthcare settings? Um, it's interesting. I'm putting together a course for a physiotherapy organisation. And yesterday, I searched for guidelines for physiotherapists on using generative AI in practice, and I couldn't find any. So I don't know what the state of play is for occupational therapy, but I'm, I, as far as I'm aware, as far as I could tell, and I, I've only just looked at this yesterday, I couldn't find any uh, any guidelines to um, to help prepare practitioners for how to start thinking about using this in practice. However... I would suggest that something like a literature review, we're all supposed to be evidence-based practitioners. Are we actually doing the literature reviews that we should be doing to base our practice on? Uh, this is a really quick way for you to take five papers on, you know, get a paper with a, a patient with a condition, download five papers with high citation rates um, on that particular condition in occupational therapy, give it to a language model, and just ask it for an overview of how you should be doing your practice. Fabulous. That's a great tip. Thank you so much, Michael. I know you're joining us this afternoon for another session, a panel session, um, where we'll be asking you more tricky questions. But thank you so much. You've, you've really opened um, our eyes this afternoon, which is exactly what we wanted you to do. So thank you, everyone. It was thank my you very pleasure. Much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Pleasure.